I'll wait. Okay, uh, by my account, we have a quorum. So I will call to order the May 2024 meeting of the Durham Bicycle Pedestrian and Advisory Commission. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we will begin our meeting as always with our land acknowledgement, and then we'll go into introductions. Uh, so let me share my screen. And I'll scroll down. Oops. There we go. Scott, all yours. Okay. We, as the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission, want to begin this meeting by affirming BPAC's commitment to equity and racial justice. We would like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on lands that have served as the home for diverse Indigenous communities long before current governments were established here. We pay our respect to the elders and members of these communities, both past and present, and recognize the harms of genocide and colonialism. We will make a conscious effort to reflect on the following questions as we advance through our business and contemplate changes in our community. And we recognize that achieving equity requires our commitment to an ongoing process. How can we seek to repair harm with our work and not erase history? How does our work impact the vulnerability and safety of people who hold many intersecting marginalized identities, including black indigenous and people of color, people with disabilities and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and questioning people? How can we prioritize and center people in our decision-making? How can we be more responsive to local needs? How can our work build community power and share decision-making? Thank you very it. much. Yep. Okay. With that, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. Um, let us do introductions. I will go around my screen as I see it. Um, I'll just call on everybody, including guests, if you want to introduce yourselves. Uh, but for the BPAC members, if you don't mind, just say who you are, um, what you do on BPAC, and um, that's pretty much it. So um, I'm Brian Hawkins. I'm the chair for 2024. I've been on BPAC since August of 22. Um, and I also serve on the DevRev committee. Ed Rizzuto, you're in my top left. I'm honored. Hi, I'm Ed Rizzuto. Uh, I've been uh, on BPAC since June of 2018. I am the county appointed to the, to the disability advocacy seat, and I uh, serve with the Triple E committee as well. Thank you, Scott. Yes, hi again, Scott Carter. And I'm the chair of the DevRev committee. Not sure how long I've been on, but like two years approximately. Great. Uh, one of our guests, Erin. Hi, everyone. I'm Erin Conberry. Uh, I'm the transportation planning manager with the city's transportation department. Uh, thanks so much for having me today. I'll be here to talk a little bit later on the agenda about our uh, ongoing work with the Durham Freeway. Thank you for being here. We're looking forward to that. Uh, Hannah. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, the Bike and Pedestrian Planner with the City of Durham and the BPAC staff liaison. Thank you. Suzanne? Hi, everyone. Suzanne Schmal, part of the Triple E Committee and been on BPAC since about 2018 as well. And I think this is my second to last meeting. <laughs> Going to acknowledge that later. But, <laughs> Good no. to see you all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bradley. You are on mute, Bradley. That's the Zoom. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Bradley Reynolds. I'm a WSP. I'm uh, here uh, with Aaron tonight. Um, I'm the project manager for the Reimagined Durham Freeway Corridor Study, and I'm happy to assist or answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you for being here. Nathan. Hi, I'm Nathan Lee. I'm the Duke liaison for BPAC and the subcommittee chair for PI, and I've been on since last July, June-ish. Great. Uh, Royal. Good afternoon. I'm Royal. I'm representing North Carolina Central University and the Fayetteville Street Corridor. Thank you very much. Mike Shepard. Tonight as well. 
Thank you, Mike. Um, Mary Rose. I was about to start and I didn't even unmute myself. Uh, I'm Mary Rose. I'm the bicycle community representative from the county. I'm also the Vision Zero liaison, and I work primarily on Pi. Thank you. Uh, Chris. I'm uh, Chris Perlstein. I'm um, in the, I believe it's the transportation planning uh, slot. Uh, this is my second meeting, and um, I guess also I will be taking over as secretary. So that's uh, that's going to be very exciting. I'm kind of practicing doing that. So um, if I'm a little less engaged today, it might be for that reason. Really appreciate you stepping up and uh, thank you for thank you for being here. I see Marissa looks like she's struggling with connecting to audio. So I'll come back to her in a minute. Um, I'm, I'm here. I'm on the oh, phone. You're here. Oh, good. Marissa, I go am. Ahead. I don't. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Sorry. I'm I'm on vacation um, and having some Internet problems. So I am uh, Marissa Hartzler. I'm the vice chair and I serve on DevRev. Marissa, thank you so much for calling in. I appreciate it. Um, dedication. Uh, Joe Wilson. Okay. I don't know if Joe wants to say hi. Okay. We'll move on to Brian Taylor. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm transportation planner for the city of Durham. I've been working with BPAC since 2019, and I'm a liaison for the BPAC PI committee. Uh, we discuss plan implementation. Thank you. Aspen? Hello, I'm Aspen Romine. I'm not on BPAC, just a frequent listener at these meetings, and I live in the Colonial Village neighborhood and I'm an advocate around North Roxboro safety. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Robin. Okay, Robin Young. I finally got my name in there. I just want to make note of that. Well I'm done. With the city of Durham Transportation Department. Thanks for being here. Heidi. Yeah, good evening, everybody. I'm Heidi Carter. I'm the county commissioner appointed to be PEC as the liaison. Thank you. And uh, I think, oh, yeah, the phone number is Marissa. And uh, I'll give Joe one more chance if he wants to say hi. Joe's audio is not working. He's interning with Bike Durham this summer. So this is, sorry, opening my chat window. This is my first meeting just as an observer. And uh, I actually got to meet Joe a couple weeks ago. So Joe, welcome here. Thanks for coming. Um, okay, great. We are all introduced. Um, as far as excused absences go, I know of Ideal. She told me she had a prior commitment. She's one of her longstanding projects has its wrap up celebration tonight. So she's doing that. Um, and he doesn't need an excuse, I don't believe, but Carl uh, Rist is in Greensboro at a transportation conference. Um, but I have some very cool updates from him that I will share in his slot later. Um, anybody else we know of uh, on the excused absences front, Hannah? So not excused, but um, just heard a couple minutes ago from Andres. He's not going to be able to make it. Okay. Besides that, no one else. Okay. And we're down Jeff, uh, who I don't recall telling us ahead of time, though I will I will double check my email just to make sure I didn't miss anything before we declare him unexcused. Um, anybody else? Uh, always feel bad if I forget somebody. OK, we'll check. OK, um, moving on then. Are there any adjustments to the agenda that we need to make for this meeting? Okay, hearing none. Um, next order of business is approval of the minutes from the April meeting. Hopefully everybody had a chance to review those. I just looked at them again myself before this meeting. I think they look okay, but um, does anybody have any comments on or corrections to the April minutes? Looking around, looking around, I'm not seeing any. If not, could I get a motion to approve them, please? 
I motion to approve the April minutes. That was Nathan. Second. Mary and Rose. Mary Rose second. Uh, all in favor of approving the April minutes as drafted? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Uh, this is quick question. Sorry. Um, okay. how do, what's the mechanics? This is my first time doing the remote meeting. What are the mechanics for uh, voting? Are we just doing verbal votes saying I, um, and do I need to do anything? And when I'm like taking minutes to like record any of this. <laughs> so, uh, usually our votes are unanimous. So the only thing that needs to be recorded is whether the motion carried or not. Um, if, Ever we come across a vote that it's in question whether it's what the count might be, um, we'll probably do a roll call um, just to make sure that that does get recorded accurately. Um, it has not come up in my time here, but that's would be my plan. Um, as far as voting, if you're on screen, raising your hands good, saying aye is good, and the hand raise icon on Zoom, any of those work. And the main thing also is when we call for any opposed or any nays, just to give adequate time for people to respond so we don't misunderstand a late yay as a nay, et cetera. Does that cover it? Did I miss anything? Anybody who's been here longer than me? I think we're good. Okay, cool. Um, great questions. <laughs> These things do matter. This is public record. So, um, this is the point of the meeting. We usually devote to public comments. We do have several guests here, so I would like to open it up um, to anybody present who would like to offer comment. We're trying to keep these to three minutes apiece. Ryan, um, yes. After that, I want to talk about the absences or the um, the positions that we still have vacant. Yeah, you know, Hannah, I apologize. I skipped right over that. We should do that first. Uh, please okay. go ahead. So um, we have had several applicants, which is good, um, but we still have a couple vacancies. So on the city side, we have a youth vacancy, which has the application deadline of actually tomorrow. Um, so if you know anyone interested, please do send them um, the application and have them submitted. I think Marissa said that she knew someone um, one of her son's friends that might be interested. So hopefully he does fill out that application. Um, yep, <laughs> working on it. <laughs> okay, awesome, good. Um, then we have three other vacancies that have an application deadline of May 31st on the county side. So there is one that is at large. There's one that is focused on senior advocacy. And then there's one that is focused on youth children advocacy. So that one is not the one that has the age limit. This is just someone who has more of a focus on um, children and younger populations. So that's actually Suzanne's current role, um, which is it next meeting will be your last meeting, Suzanne, right? Um, so sad to see her go, but we definitely need to get someone in um, for that role. That's it. Hey, thank you for clarifying it because I thought it was actually another youth position. So that no, I, I had to do a couple, yeah, checks on that, but okay. It's so an adult that would be representing the youth community. So that's one at large, one senior advocacy, and one youth advocacy position all open with the county, and the city youth rep position is still open. Yep. And everything else is filled so far. Um, yes, to my knowledge, um, Great. they would have gone through for appointment, but I haven't heard anything on if anyone's been appointed yet. So, okay. I know of at least two applicants, so I'm feeling good about that. And, uh, I assume if they don't get an applicant for the youth rep job by tomorrow, that that will roll over another month. Yeah. I, I was planning to plug it at the biking while black event tomorrow. So. Okay, yeah, awesome. I'll, I'll 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 shoot you an email um to see if it got filled at the last minute. I'll, I'll plug BPAC either way, but um that one in particular it seemed like a good opportunity. So definitely. Yeah, ask Marissa because okay. It sounds like Marissa's been talking with the youth. Great. The one 
Okay, thank you for getting me back on track there. Um, now, public comments, would anybody like to make one? Everybody's here to listen, that's okay. Um, great, then in that case, I get to turn the floor over to Aaron. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, well, oh, oh, give me a second here, I'm gonna share my screen. Are you all able to see um, the PowerPoint presentation? Looks great. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you everyone again for having us today. Um, like I said earlier, my name is Erin Convery and I work uh, with Hannah in our transportation planning group um, at the city. And I'm here today to talk about our uh, Pathways to Connection study, uh, which is how we've branded our, our study to reimagine the Durham Freeway. Um, so over the course of uh, today's presentation, let's see, there we go. Um, I'll be providing you all with a brief overview of our project team and our project organization, some the purpose of the study, some of the federal program background and philosophy that's in, informing the study work, um, providing an overview of our engagement efforts, a little uh, snapshot of some of the existing conditions analysis that we've got going on, uh, and then closing out with some um, information on timeline where you can find resources, and then we'll open it up for a Q&A. And um, you all met Bradley earlier. He's here from our WSP team and will uh, be able to participate in that Q&A as well. Um, just as a heads up for questions, um, it's a little tricky with my screen share for me to see the chat while I've got the screen share going. So um, we'll try to save questions for the end and if any, but feel free to drop them in the chat as we go and I'll make sure to revisit any of those um, once we get there. All right, so um, like I said, to start, uh, this is an overview of the project team that we've got working on the Reimagine Durham Freeway study. Um, we've got folks from the City of Durham Transportation Department. Uh, the Transportation Department is leading the study. Uh, we have a team of community partners who are heading up our engagement efforts. And then we've got a technical team um, who's uh, supporting those engagement efforts with some technical and feasibility analysis that help us um, uh, evaluate some of the feedback we're getting and how it can be uh, implemented into future visions for the freeway corridor. Um, one thing I want to highlight about this graphic, uh, it is intentionally a, a round circle, not a, a org chart uh, in a hierarchy kind of fashion. Um, we're really trying to be really deliberate in this study about elevating our engagement efforts um, and making sure that those are really on an even playing field with the technical analysis. Sometimes engagement kind of uh, is subbed out or something like that in these studies. And um, for this first phase of visioning around the Durham Freeway, that community engagement piece is really at the forefront. Um, so just a couple of faces to introduce you to um, on our team, uh, we've got our City of Durham leads include myself. Um, I'm working closely with Evian Patterson and Bill Judge, who are two assistant directors. Um, those of you who have been on BPAC for a while probably uh, have encountered them somewhere along the way. Um, and then another familiar face for uh, BPAC folks, um, our community partners team is being led by Ideal Ortiz and her firm Idealisms. Um, and she's partnered with Angel Isaac Dozier, uh, who works with a group called Be Connected Durham. Um, we're really excited that Ideal and Angel are leading these engagement efforts. They were um, incredibly involved in uh, setting up the city of Durham's uh, equitable community engagement blueprint and have kind of laid the foundation uh, for the type of engagement work we're trying to do um, on this project uh, kind of across the city. and are also very um, intertwined with a lot of the communities uh, that the freeway runs through uh, in the Fayetteville Street Corridor, East Durham and others. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we've got a technical team. Bradley's here today. 
uh, with WSP um, that's supporting those engagement efforts uh, through their technical work. Uh, and that team actually consists of a variety of firms. So we've got um, folks who are working on engineering. Um, we've got Spanish speaking, doing helping out with uh, translation services. Neighboring Concepts is going to be helping with some um, placemaking type work. So uh, a, a team with a variety of disciplines here um, supporting the Durham Freeway Study. So that's just a little introduction into some of the um, faces and names you might encounter uh, as you get involved uh, with the Durham Freeway work. Um, in addition to kind of that project team, we have built out um, a couple different groups of stakeholders and committees that are supporting uh, the project work on this as well. So, excuse me. <clears throat> um, we have one group uh, that's comprised of what we're calling institutional stakeholders. Um, and so these are um, folks representing some of our key institutions in Durham, um, uh, universities. Um, we also have uh, elected officials participating in the institutional stakeholders group. I know Commissioner Carter was at one of our recent meetings, um, as well as kind of just other folks um, related to some of the um, key community uh, institutions within Durham. Um, we have a technical committee that's supporting the group or the project, excuse me. And this is more of your staff level um, technical folks. So the people who wanna dive into the traffic analysis and all of that kind of stuff. Um, in addition to kind of those usual transportation focused staff, um, we've cast a kind of wide net uh, for this tech technical committee uh, pulling in some departments that maybe aren't typically part of a transportation study, um, Office of um, Economic and Workforce Development, um, DHA, agencies like that. Um, because while this is a fo study focused on the freeway, uh, we do know that it touches a lot of uh, different areas. Um, and we want to have that perspective being brought to the study through our technical committee as well. Um, this also is really beneficial because um, when we're out doing our engagement, we also are hearing a lot of different things um, about all sorts of things related and adjacent to the freeway. And so this helps us quickly uh, connect folks with the right people uh, when it's kind of something maybe a little bit outside the scope of the Durham Freeway Study, but still a really important uh, concern or consideration. We want to make sure it's getting to the right, right staff. Um, third, we have a public engagement committee, um, and that is, uh, consists of, uh, a lot of our folks who are kind of more rooted in the grassroots community organizations, um, that are supporting this effort. Their role is, um, providing feedback on our engagement approaches. Um, so they are and helping um, shape our engagement approaches. Uh, one example, a very concrete example of that, uh, the public engagement committee worked with the project team to develop the project branding um, and kind of what uh, names and messaging resonated with them. Um, they helped develop some of and worked on getting out yard signs, things like that. So kind of some of those on the ground um, engagement pieces. And then lastly, of course, we have um, the feedback from the general public. So right now we are in a, an engagement period that I'll talk a little bit more in detail about um, for this first phase of the study, um, kind of a listening focused engagement period here in April through June. Um, we'll spend the summer um, synthesizing some of that information and then come back out uh, in October and of course have uh, opportunities to engage online as well. So um, that's a high level overview of some of the key stakeholders involved in, in the study, um, just to keep in mind as we go through kind of what we've been working on so far. So what is the Reimagined Durham Freeway Study? Um, so this um, study is 
funded through uh, the DCHC MPO. Like I said, the City Transportation Department is leading um, leading the study. Uh, and at this point, we are looking to create a community-led vision for the future of the freeway corridor. Um, and that vision will inform future planning and potentially design and construction efforts. Um, we do recognize that the Durham Freeway uh, created a lot of damage and harm when it was originally constructed. So as as even as we're looking forward to creating a vision for the future of the freeway, we also, through this study, want to be um, cognizant, cognizant about acknowledging the impacts that the Durham Freeway had uh, when it was constructed and, and to this day on um, things like community connections. Um, there were entire neighborhoods that were destroyed. And so that that piece is a really big um, piece of this study as well. Um, we can't really separate that future vision uh, from the from the past harms. Um, so as we listen and understand how the freeway has impacted folks, we also do want to look forward to what uh, kind of really opening up that um, imagination process of what could the future of the freeway be. Uh, so this study aims to reimagine the future character of the corridor. And then a key piece of this is looking at those reconnections. Um, like I said, communities were destroyed and divided by this freeway. Um, and we're hoping through this vision to understand how we can start to rebuild those connections, um, both at a community level and then also um, you know, thinking from a, a transportation um, and mobility and access connections as well. Um, some of you might be aware that there is a, um, a lot of enthusiasm for this kind of work at the federal level right now and enthusiasm and funding um, dollars. So um, this slide just shares a little bit of background information on kind of the federal context that we're working in as we um, embark on this study. So uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, there um, is a um, grant program called the Reconnecting Communities and Neighborhoods Program. And this um, is aimed at reconnecting communities by removing, retrofitting, or mitigating highways and other transportation facilities that are creating barriers to community connectivity. Um, it's also looking at priori prioritizing disadvantaged communities, um, improving access to daily needs, and fostering equitable community development. Um, so as you can see, or as you can imagine, um, this program is a really good fit uh, for the Durham Freeway. Um, so this visioning study that we're working on now is aimed at kind of preparing Durham for um, reconnecting communities and neighborhoods funding. Um, I will share, we did apply for a grant last year um, in community planning. Um, we were not awarded that grant, but um, we are, through this visioning study, hoping to put ourselves in um, a better position for our next application. Um, I'll note here too, there are two different pots of funding. There's a planning um, pot of funding um, that would be kind of where we would be headed next. Um, that would help us build out some more feasibility and concept design as we develop this vision. Um, and then there's also um, capital construction funding. Um, the Durham Freeway is owned and maintained by NCDOT. So if we got to the point where we were submitting a capital construction grant, uh, NCDOT would need to be the applicant for that. So um, that's just a little um, side note on kind of where some of this grant funding would be heading as we progress through this process. So now I'd like to just take a little time to walk through some of the project approach and some of the work we've been doing up until this point. Um, so as I mentioned early on, engagement is really at the forefront of this phase of study and visioning. Um, so um, 
The, some of the approaches here, as I mentioned before, a big part of this engagement effort is listening, understanding how the freeway has impacted folks, what their ideas are for its future. Um, and in this first phase, we're really focused on that listening piece, um, kind of helping, trying to support folks in, like I said, being imaginative and having vision for the future of the freeway. Uh, but we know Another piece of this is going to be education. What are other cities doing um, around the country uh, when it comes to their freeways? Um, what has worked well, what hasn't, and how can we adapt that and learn lessons for our context here in Durham? Um, there's also elements of coordination and support um, that go into uh, just all the events. Um, we are working with a lot of community organizations and um, uh, going, meeting people where they're at, um, tagging along to events that are already happening. Um, and so um, through this project, hoping to support um, other organizations in their efforts uh, around engagement. Um, some of you might have been uh, involved in some of the work around the Better Bus Project the last couple years. These photos here on this slide are from um, some community partner events from that study, uh, but we're really building off of a lot of the, the work that we've done through those community partner organizations uh, with tabling, canvassing, like I said, um, participating in events that are already happening um, and not necessarily all transportation focused events. So uh, you can see a picture here. Um, this is from Better Bus Project where we were out at a community garden event at Club Boulevard Elementary. Um, so again, meeting folks where they're at um, and providing those opportunities for conversation and listening. Um, so here's a snapshot of some of what we've been up to so far on the engagement front. Um, these are uh, just kind of going around the, um, I guess, clockwise on these. Uh, we've been out at the West End Free Market at the Lion Park Community Center every month. Uh, that middle top photo is a walk we did with our institutional stakeholders over at the Grant Street underpass. Um, Ideal has um, been in more places than I ever thought it was humanly possible for one person to be. She's tabling everywhere. Um, so uh, this is her at um, a walk that was hosted by Whistle Stop Tours, uh, starting at the Haytai Heritage Center. You can see a photo of that on the bottom right. Um, we were out at the um, Durham Central Park playlist event uh, there in that middle, bottom middle photo. Um, and then bottom left where you're looking at um, a pop-up event that was held at Missy Lane's uh, called, um, I think it was Connections Over Coffee or Coffee Over Connections. I always get it in the wrong order, but it had a very clever name. Um, so th that's just a smattering of some of the um, events we've had so far. As you can see, we're trying to reach different groups. Um, and one of our asks here tonight for you all is if you have any um, events through any of your organizations or anything like that, that it would be um, helpful to bring materials to, um, please let us know and we will um, we will work with you to make that happen. Um, so uh, this, uh, engagement period that we've been in right now started back in April. So we're about two thirds of the way through, uh, but we do have a full calendar of events coming up in June. Um, I've highlighted those here. Um, we'd love to see you all, um, out at any of these events. Um, if you do come out, you will, um, have the opportunity to take our survey, um, but you don't have to take it at one of these events. You can also uh, do it from your phone or computer if you'd like. Uh, the survey is live. Um, there's a link uh, to it here on the screen. Um, we also have an event registration link up as well. Um, there's a couple events, um, particularly the walking tour that you see there on June 1st that um, do have a... Um, certain number of folks who can attend. So uh, you, we ask that folks register for that. 
Um, registering for the other events just gets you on a handy dandy list where you'll get reminders um, and things like that uh, ahead of the event so that you don't lose track of it on your calendar. So as we've been um, doing this first big engagement push as part of the study, we have also been uh, in the background, Bradley and his team have been working on um, an existing conditions analysis of the freeway corridor and the surrounding study area. Um, this existing conditions analysis is kind of that first technical step um, that's going to inform um, the identifying uh, potential alternatives um, and um, ultimately leading to that vision plan for the corridor. Um, a key piece of this, um, I mentioned earlier that NCDOT owns and maintains the facility. So um, a lot of this technical work that's happening in the background when it comes to existing conditions um, is really important as we um, look to um, partner and kind of build buy-in with uh, the state on what the future of this corridor could look like. Um, so many of you are probably uh, familiar with the freeway. I think most folks in Durham either travel along it or across it. Um, at some point in time, it runs right through the heart of town. Um, but it is a four lane divided controlled access freeway. So that means, you know, it has on ramps and on ramps and on ramps and off ramps. Um, and the in particular, the area we're looking at for this study uh, runs from Swift Avenue to the I-885 interchange. So that's near the new East End connector. Um, through this part of the freeway, it's a 55 mile per hour facility. Uh, we see um, a range of 67,000 to 79,000 um, daily uh, vehicles per day on average, um, or excuse me, annual daily um, vehicles. And um, so that's how we see the freeway today. Another big part of the, when we think about existing conditions is how construction of the freeway impacted the surrounding areas. So when the freeway was constructed, it's estimated that uh, it displaced over 4,000 families and 500 businesses. Uh, so you can see in this image um, on the screen, which is from the Bull City uh, 150 uh, effort uh, that was um, during Durham's 150th anniversary. They've got some great uh, resources on their website about the freeway construction, uh, but you can kind of see some historical imagery overlaid with uh, the current uh, aerial imagery of Durham, and you can just see uh, the difference in um, the land use and the street patterns and the buildings that were uh, there before the freeway was constructed compared to what we see today. Um, along with the displacement of those families and businesses, um, we uh, have taken, or WSP has taken a deep dive into some historical uh, maps of Durham and identified that um, over the length of what is now the freeway in our study area, there were 50 um, connections, uh, opportunities to cross what is now the freeway, um, and 34 of those have been removed. So on the next slide here, you can see a visual of that. Um, and so all those red dots are places where you used to be able to cross what is now the freeway and are no longer able to. Um, and those green dots are the remaining crossing opportunities. Um, so I think this map, um, when we think about, you know, reconnecting communities, um, I think this map really tells a story of the community connections that were destroyed when the freeway was built and some of what we're looking to try to think about and imagine what we could restore in the future through this visioning study. Um, so as we continue on this work, um, WSP and their team is going to be, is in the process of putting together some existing conditions reporting um, 
The freeway is not a standalone facility. It interacts with um, everything around it. And so we're looking at lots of different planning documents, things like land use and demographics, um, travel demand modeling and traffic analysis. Um, again, as far as how the roadway currently functions and what it might function like in the future, or or that'll be part of the, the future and um, conditions analysis. Um, another big element of this is uh, crash analysis. I think um, this group probably pretty familiar with um, uh, the city's uh, commitment to vision zero. Um, and so um, folding that in and making sure that's a primary piece of this study, how, how, do, how is um, safety being considered uh, for the future of the freeway? And then also looking at connections, or excuse me, um, other modes of transportation um, that currently aren't really part of the freeway itself, or at least traveling along it for the most part, um, bicycle and pedestrian facilities, but we know those are also very key as far as being able to get across the highway. Um, and then of course we have transit as well. How are, how are buses um, using the freeway um, both again along and across? Um, so with that, I'm going to take a moment to switch screens here um, as we think about um, these existing conditions. Um, Angel, who's part of our community partners team, um, regularly reminds us that lived experience is data. So as we are looking at all those data points and analysis that I just outlined, um, I want to take a moment here to share a video um, from a series of interviews that Angel conducted um, called Hey Thai Stories, uh, just to provide again that that lived experience context um, on how uh, the freeway um, is experienced by those um, living near it. So let me switch over. Are you all seeing a YouTube screen? And did you hear a little bit of audio? Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to hit play here um, and we'll watch this video. And then re um, if anyone has any trouble with the audio or anything like that, once I'm done with the presentation, I'll also drop the link in the chat. My family's grocery store, J.L. Page and Sons Grocery, was a community hub. 7 a.m. is the time my father would open the grocery store with his brother, and he would stay there till 11 p.m. at night. There were actually days I never saw my father, even though he came home every night, because he left before I would get up to go to school, and he would come home after I was in bed. What were they doing there from 7 to 11? Talking. People would come and they would congregate and lean up against the Coca-Cola um, machine and they just talk about everything that was going on, all the um, business of the community was happening there. So people often would come by J.L. Page and Sons grocery store to find out what's happening in Durham. My grandmother was often called Mama Page by a lot of the people in the neighborhood because they would go up there and talk to her all the time. <laughs> There were a lot of people in this neighborhood who needed help. <laughs> so they felt that they, they felt they could go to them for help. So if it was Sunday morning, the doorbell would ring and someone would need money to pay for something and my father would give them the money. It's a wonderful legacy, but also I realized how little I understood about what was happening to people's lives who were living so close to me, and I had no idea how different their lives were and what they did not have that uh, I did have. Being able to have food was a huge thing. So be, you know, being in a grocery store, um, if your parents have a grocery store, you were rich. And I never thought about that because we didn't own a car. We used the car with my 
of my uncles, we shared a car, but we always had food and uh, that made a big difference. So when my father would, um, my father would uh, give people food if they needed it, it was a payment plan, there was a book and you would write down, you would board, um, whatever you owe for groceries, they would write it down in the book. And that book remained open until the store closed because a lot of them never paid the bills. I threw the book away and they said, why did you throw it away? Because I didn't want anyone to know who owed money. When my father found out the 147, we called it Urban Renewal, was coming to the lower part of Fayetteville Street, he was devastated. He was hurt. He knew it was gonna tear down White Rock Baptist Church, his church home, since he was a child and he loved that church. He loved that community and he couldn't understand how they could do that. And he would say, they say it's gonna be better. They're gonna bring things better to us but I can't see how they can take that church. How can you tear down the church? I think we all felt guilty. The people down the street lost and we were still there. We were, they didn't move us. And I thought, what would have happened to the store if they had come further down? If when they tore those homes down, I, it's just unimaginable. It was unspeakable. And I think that my family didn't speak about it. I feel that by not protesting and fighting for the Haiti, that we lost the respect of our community. The people who live here, who were looking for somebody to step up and say something, looking for the leadership to say, we need to change this, to protest the destruction of this neighborhood. And for me, this community shaped who, the stories I know, they shaped where I am, who I have become. The importance of, of keeping this neighborhood for historical purposes so we know what it was, what it was like, and what it can be like again. I want to get out and I want to protest. I didn't do that when I was young, I didn't march. But now I think, oh my God, we cannot let this happen. All right. When they text. Oh, sorry, that was the next video starting. Let's see. Are you all able to see the PowerPoint again? Oh, and it's on the first slide. So let me zoom through real quick. Um, so thank you all for for watching the video with us. I will share, um, like I said, the link to that uh, in the chat. Um, there's also uh, a couple others that are up on that same YouTube channel. Um, They're truly worth the watch uh, if you have some time. Um, So just to close out the presentation part here, I will share um, kind of some, um, a look at uh, kind of the process of the study and where we're heading. Um, so we we started this um, Pathways to Connection visiting study uh, just this past winter. Uh, and uh, this phase of study will extend to summer of 2025. So uh, we are currently um, at, the, at, at the beginning of this. Um, you can see here, we've been working on our community outreach um, and then um, are at the point where we're starting to look at some deliverables around that existing uh, conditions analysis that I mentioned that WSP has been working on. Um, over the next couple months will be, or over the course of the summer, we working to synthesize a lot of the data and feedback we got through this first page phase of community outreach and engagement, along with those existing conditions, bringing that together um, and working through um, uh, putting together kind of a um, toolbox of different um, potential future visions for the freeway 
that are informed by that community outreach and vision. So um, that'll help us uh, kind of align what we're hearing from the community with some potential options for the freeway moving forward. Uh, and will help us uh, understand and communicate some of the the trade-offs that might come along with those as well as we go into um, the next phase of engagement in the fall. And then ultimately, as we work through uh, the future conditions analysis, um, we'll be evaluating some of those alternatives uh, and ultimately with the goal of of coming to that uh, that vision. Um, and we're we're calling it a community-led vision. I want to um, emphasize that of that this is uh, a vision that's um, going to be really tied back to uh, the engagement efforts that are associated with this um, with the study um, so that we're building that trust um, as we go through this process um, and ha and resulting in that in that vision. Oh, um, and then I'll uh, just to remind folks we have a um, project website. Um, this is actually a screenshot of a, a little bit uh, older version of the website, but the URL is the same. Um, so that's durhamnc.gov 5201. We'll get you there. Um, there's a link in the in the presentation in the agenda as well. Um, and uh, when you go to that page, uh, there is a uh, English option as well as a Spanish option, um, if that's of interest. Um, and that's also where, again, you can find the survey uh, and event registration links um, as well. And as the study progresses, um, different deliverables and things like that will be um, posted to this web page. So with that, um, I will uh, close out the presentation part of this and we can shift to Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Erin, for that presentation. I thought that was really, sure. really great. Um, we have a couple of questions queued up in the chat. I'm going to take the first one, though, and I'll just note for time, we have about 13 minutes for Q&A and discussion. So just asking everybody to calibrate their questions and discussion accordingly. We're going to try to stay on time. Um, Erin, can I circle back? You um, mentioned federal funding uh, applied for and that you're hoping to leverage what you're getting in the study to, to take another run at that, which I think is a great, um, great thing to do. You, the planning um, grants the city can apply for, which is the next stage. And then you mentioned that for a capital uh, grant to actually support getting this built, that NCDOT would need to be the, the primary applicant. I realize that's out there in terms of timeline, but surely you're thinking about it. Um, do, do you have a plan to how to engage and get buy-in from NCDOT um, for a project that seems very likely to, we want it to tilt towards closing down a freeway, um, which historically is not something they seem very interested in doing? Sure. Yeah. So um, I feel uh, I can pull the slide up again. Sorry, I stopped sharing my screen. But while I do that, um, uh, if you recall, there we have a, a technical committee that is um, uh, let's see, sure, um, that is playing a key role in the study. Um, and so we have representatives from NCDOT on this uh, technical committee. Oh. Um, and so they are um, being plugged in from the very beginning here um, when it comes to kind of project approach, uh, review of those deliverables. And then I'll also say that's another big piece um, when we're talking about the technical analysis that's undergirding the engagement here, um, we understand that there are stakeholders such as NCDOT who um, are going to want to see that kind of analysis in order to have buy-in um, with um, any sort of proposals coming out of out of this visioning process. So um, we're kind of pairing the the vision, but we've got a feasibility element too, right? Um, and that's that's where that's the kind of um, the kind of thing that NCDOT wants to see um, and needs to see to understand how how this would work for them. Um, and I know Bradley, um, if if you if anyone here has any kind of more specific questions on like the modeling or traffic or anything like that, that 
that is um, a big part of that analysis. Um, Bradley, I think, could could speak to some of that. Okay, great. I'm going to go to the questions that lined up in the queue first, and then we'll open it up. Uh, the first one was from Heidi. Uh, how does this community study relate, if at all, to Discover Durham's destination master plan? One of its recommendations is to construct a greenway cap across 147 uh, to reconnect Haytai and downtown. Yes, that's a great question. So um, again, I've, we've got this, uh, <laughs> our go-to slide here. Um, so we are, through this study, trying to convene a lot of those institutional um, stakeholder groups uh, like Downtown Discover Durham, Downtown Durham Inc., and others. Um, we know that there are a lot of ideas floating around about the future of the freeway. Um, and what we're hoping to do here with um, convening these institutional stakeholder groups is to kind of be the, the tent that we can all um, work together under um, so that um, these, you know, we, I say this study started in winter 2024. You know, that's this phase of this transportation department study, but we know there's been a lot of momentum and conversation around the freeway up until this point. So whether it's the Discover Durham plan or, you know, there's a lot of conversations around um, the different um, efforts in Haytai with um, Fayette Place and some of those um, locations near the freeway. The idea here is that this, um, this study can kind of build buy-in from all of those different groups that have been having those conversations around the freeway and kind of bring it together under under this tent of, of pathways to connection and help inform a, a unified approach when it comes time to apply for that federal funding. Great, great answer. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, and I had a question from Scott about stakeholders, actually, which is, um, are current users of the freeway, such as commuters to RTP or Duke, considered stakeholders? And I might also add, like, um, major employers in RTP. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think, you know, we definitely, through this engagement effort, um, have um, focused on trying to reach some of those communities that live near the freeway. Uh, just in that those are often the communities that um, we don't get good turnout with when it comes to like online surveys and things like that. Um, but we definitely understand that the freeway is more than uh, impacts more than just the people who live right near it. Um, people use it as part of their day to day, like you said, commuting. Um, I was just in an event the other day where um, a woman was telling me about, you know, being late for work because of traffic on the freeway. And, you know, those are all really valid concerns about, um, about how people use, use the freeway. It's, it's become, it's been here since the seventies, it's become an integral part of people's lives. And so that, that is definitely part of, part of this. Um, and we welcome that feedback, um, you know, as, as part of the conversation as well. Cool. Uh, Scott, Actually, did you have any follow-up on that? Yeah. Uh, as we know, with the light rail, you know, Duke came in at pretty much the 11th hour and squashed it. And just wondering whether, you know, university and big companies and whatever whose employees um, use the freeway, whether they're considered to be stakeholders and are we going to uh, be able to not have them flex their muscles in a you know, in a destructive way for for what the, you know, project could look like? Yeah, so we do, especially on the university front, um, we have included universities in our institutional stakeholder group. Um, I think the feedback about um, major employers and RTP is a great point, and we can um, certainly make sure we're um, reaching out in that way. Um, again, I think this kind of goes back to a little bit of what we were talking about with um, the other plan that Commissioner Carter mentioned of this being, we're kind of, uh, our approach here is to kind of build buy-in early on. Um, so that we're really starting with this visioning um, and trying to bring people into the fold as we go. Um, and so that's um, a key part of this approach. Um, 
and again, that, uh, that feasibility piece, um, we, this is a lot, this kind of is a, we are working on a vision and doing our, our due diligence about, um, what, how can we make that vision a reality, um, in the future? And so, um, bringing these key institutional stakeholders in early in the conversation, um, but also pairing that with the more kind of grassroots um, engagement efforts so that we are uh, uh, not hearing those grassroots voices uh, being drowned out by those institutional voices. Thank you. Great. Um, Chris, I saw you actually asked about NCDOT involvement in the chat as well, and Bradley addressed it. I just wanted to give you the opportunity. Do you have any follow-up questions on that? Um, no, I think that was the the big question. I think um, you know the the concern um, that I have is you know how active of a participant are they in this process? Are they somebody who um, wants to truly like explore this and let this process move forward in a way um, that maybe results in something that is a change in the status quo, right? Um, and so you know, hearing that they're part of the at least the technical committee. Um, hopefully indicates that they are uh, not just there in name only, but actively participating. Uh, so that was, that covered it. Thanks, Chris. we got a couple minutes left. If anybody else has any questions, uh, is that Mike raising your hand or is that my cursor? Oh, that's my cursor. Sorry. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Yeah, this is it. Um, I just want to return to to Scott's point. Um, you know, I, I think that's really, really, significant, you know, just bringing in institutional stakeholders. Um, I guess that's appropriate, but how are you going to prioritize um, the people who have been adversely impacted over those institutions? Because we, we we're probably can anticipate that the institutional stakeholders position is going to be uh, let it let it ride. It gets us to work quicker. It's it's economically great for our 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 um research triangle businesses and stuff um so how do you prioritize the um people whose voices have historically not been heard as loudly as the institutional stakeholders yeah i think that's a really really good perspective um i'll say i don't think there's a perfect answer to that. Um, but some of what we are trying to do, um, like I said, this, this, um, the heart of this is getting to that community led vision. Um, and so with that, um, we are being very intentional about who, uh, and what communities we're concentrating our engagement efforts in, um, with the goal of trying to elevate some of those voices that, like you said, Ed, maybe often are not heard. Um, so um, who whose stories are getting told? How is that shaping this narrative? Um, and how is that shaping the future of the freeway? I think, um, you know, from a very practical standpoint, that means we're doing a lot of canvassing um, in neighborhoods uh, near the freeway, uh, like Haytai and West End. Um, doing things like talking to folks at bus stops. Um, so just make, you know, reaching out in ways that are, um, take a lot of legwork, but but um, are focused on making sure we're hearing uh, from those people. We are um, in the middle of this first engagement effort. So right now we're doing a look at some of the, um, around like midpoint kind of how some of the survey um, demographics and things like that are playing out. So we, uh, one example, um, I know right now, um, over the next, uh, the rest of the survey, we're noticing that we are not getting as many, um, Latinx respondents to the survey. And so like, uh, adjusting and figuring out what events and things like that we can tap into to reach, um, our Spanish speaking communities. So, that's just one example of the kind of adjustments we are making along the way to try to um, make sure we're hearing from those different voices. Thank you. 
I think that's a fantastic place to leave it. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for that presentation. Thank you, Bradley, for being here and, and fielding our questions. Um, we have Aaron's presentation in the Google Drive folder for this meeting, and there's a bunch of links being shared out, and that'll also be captured in the minutes uh, when we put them together. Um, Aaron, please let us know how we can support and advocate for this going forward. Great. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, uh, like I said, I'll drop the link to the video uh, in the chat. I'll also drop the survey and event registration. Um, and please do tap into your networks uh, to spread the word uh, on the survey. Um, and, and we hope to see you at some of our engagement events. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Moving on down the line, uh, we come to old business, um, which actually, yeah, we can do this one real quick. Might have to come back to this when I get to Carl's report, but um, looking ahead at the uh, speaker schedule, we had to do a little juggling behind the scenes um, because of availability for the next couple of months. But um, my understanding is now for next month's meeting in June, we are slated for um, the racial equity training we tried to get earlier this year. And is that still good? I think so. I'll confirm with her closer to the time, but it seems like it was good did, you know, did, in, in person. And that, yeah, that'll be in person. Did Sharon indicate how long she needed for that? Um. I think it was at least 45 minutes if it was in person. Um, okay. I think she said longer if it was virtual. So, um, okay. yeah, I did mention that it would be 45 minutes, including the Q&A. So I think, yeah, just making sure that public comment or however we structure it to make sure there's enough time. Okay. Yeah. And I got a late breaking request today for another possible presentation for the next meeting. Um, we'll we'll talk about that when I get to Carl Rist's uh, report. Um, we we may need to be a little creative next month, um, and I don't want to reschedule the racial equity training again. So. Yeah, next month is <laughs> the last month that they're offering it for. Okay, well then we so got it. Yeah, so it's not something they always do. It was just this year. And I think I saw also some email right before the meeting, um, Marissa indicating that um, we are good to have the DDI master plan in August. Um, yes, um, they were checking um, with all of the folks that may um, uh, be interested in presenting as part of that team, but they felt that August uh, looked like it was um, much better of a go than, than June would be. So, yeah. Great. Went all around then. Okay. Um, I think that's all we need to discuss on that for now then. Um, let me stop sharing. So then uh, that gets us to new business and that's uh, Hannah, right? Yeah, Hannah. Yes, so this is something that um, I forwarded to everyone's email um, that's on the commission. Um, so a colleague, Emma Vanella Brusher, is hoping that someone on BPAC would be interested and willing to be a um, application reviewer. So the shared micro mobility program with the city of Durham, um, they are hoping to get new vendors. Um, so micro mobility is scooters, um, you know, stand ones, and they're hoping to get e-bikes and then also scooters that you can sit on. And so they're restructuring um, the permit and um, with that, they're hoping new vendors will apply. And so um, she thinks that she expects that there will probably be around six vendors that apply, um, but it is a pretty strict timeline of when applications have to come in and then um, when she has to let them know if they were selected and so forth. And so um, because you all are experienced and knowledgeable in this field. She really wanted to have someone from BPAC represent um, the community and have someone on. Um, I, 
in the email, it mentions the application schedule um, and it's a little bit more structured. So I know not everyone can do this, especially if you work, um, which everyone does. But um, so you'll have to kind of look based on your schedule. But she thinks that in total, it would be less than 10 hours to work on this. Um, again, it may not be for everyone, but if anyone is interested, just know she wants um, a volunteer and someone to help with it. Um, so yeah, that's, if you have any other questions to let me know, um, well actually directly let Emma know um, her, her contact information is in the email that I forwarded to everyone. So, um, but also if you are interested, I put um, to let me know by Friday, this Friday, um, so I can give her a heads up of, hey, no one wants to do this, or we have a few people that are interested. And just to add one point, it, mm -hmm. I mean, it's in your email you sent to everybody, that 10 hour time commitment will take place in the month of June. Yeah, exactly. It's So that's soon and tight. Pretty fast, yeah. And I mean, also, if you're not able to do all of it, but you are interested in maybe giving some input, um, yeah, just let Emma know, and I'm sure she'd be willing to kind of work around your schedule. So, any questions from the peanut gallery for Hannah about that? Okay, great. We will move ahead then. Thanks for sharing that with us. Maybe someone can. Step up. So um, we uh, shuffled a little bit the order of our committee and liaison reports for this month. Um, we're going to actually start having our government liaisons go first um, in case they want to do something else with the rest of their evenings. Um, so um, Carl is actually not here tonight. I have something for him. But Heidi, if you don't mind going first, that will give me just a second to pull up my email from Carl. Sure. OK. Yeah, I had uh, two things I wanted to mention. Um, one is that at our last county commissioner meeting, we approved um, an interlocal agreement with the, the city and the city of Durham and Central Pines Regional Council um, for a feasibility study um, for the development of an 18 mile long non-active rail corridor between Roxboro and um, downtown Durham, basically. And this is just uh, it's $500,000, 400,000 of which would be federal funding, and it would require a match of $100,000 that the county, the city, and the Central Pines Regional Council will be splitting. Um, so I think, I think that's very exciting. This Durham to Roxboro trails, 18 miles long, uh, it was listed as a future project in the 2011 Durham Trails and Greenways Master Plan. Um, if it does end up being developed, it would connect northern Durham County, including Bahama and Rougemont, to the existing Greenway network within the city and the county. Um, the southern ter terminus would connect with what's going to be the Durham Rail Trail. Uh, so, and it would run through neighborhoods like Bragtown. It, it will be a wonderful amenity. Um, and it's a project that has a program manager right now, and um, we're excited about this feasibility study, which will look at not only the feasibility, but the benefits and the cost and the impact of, of developing such a rail trail. So I did want to mention that. And then the only other thing is just in general, I thought you might be interested in a little bit of information about the recommended county budget, uh, the budget that was recommended to us by the county manager last Monday night. Um, it's close to a billion dollars uh, in, in, in funding and um, uh, operational funding is more like $650 million. But anyway, it's quite a lot of money. And our natural growth in revenue continues to grow, but the rate of growth is slowing down um, at the same time as the state is decreasing funding for things like public schools at the same time as our community, as you know, is growing and um, there's a high increased demand for services of all kinds. And so 
we do feel like we're working with a constrained tight budget um, at a time when the, the needs are, are still very great in our community. Um, so the manager's recommending a 3.25 cent tax increase. That would be 3.25 cent increase per every $100 value um, of a property. Um, so that's the current manager's recommendation. The commissioners are starting work sessions on Thursday. I think we have five scheduled and um, we'll be hearing from departments and analyzing their requests and analyzing, you know, all the funding that we think we have and ways to generate new funding, um, which are very limited, um, really just tax increases. Um, so anyway, I thought I would mention that and see if anybody had any questions about that. Thank you. Any questions for Heidi? All right. Thank you very much. Yep. You're welcome. So um, Carl is at uh, the Transportation Summit in Greensboro, I believe. Uh, but he emailed two items that he wanted to bring to our attention. The first one also is budget related. Um, which is that um, he had some updates, um, even from the last April budget retreat he shared with us previously. I'll put a link in the chat there with a document he shared with me to share with you, um, which is the city council's budget briefing. It's I haven't had a chance to read it yet because I just got it, um, but you can read it uh, and I recommend that you do. Um, entire budget, as is from Carl, entire budget is worth reviewing. I've attached a summary you may share. In addition to the obvious headline, which is an 8.7% increase in the general fund, uh, largely fund increases in staff pay and an accompanying tax increase. So that's from the city. Uh, members of BPAC may be particularly interested in the capital improvement project presentation that starts on page eight. Again, this is the document I just linked to. Um, under new capital project appropriations for 24-25, this provides a list of CIP investments for 24-25 has a lot of items of interest to bicyclists and pedestrians. Please note this new list is somewhat different from the CIP investments I shared at the last BPAC meeting from the April budget retreat. This is because the bond issue that the council approved last night, which is the second item, by the way, um, to put before voters in November would absorb some of the items that, has, that uh, had appeared on the CIP budget. I've not yet been able to completely review these changes, but they are positive for bike and pet active advocates. Uh, in the end, also note an additional 15 million for sidewalk and street repair in the 24-25 budget. So that's the update on the budget and you can review uh, the briefing at your leisure. Um, the other item uh, already alluded to is uh, the 2024 general obligation bond referendum. Uh, last night, council authorized the finance director to apply to the local government commission for approval of the city's proposed uh, geo bond financing to go before voters in November. This would be a $200 million bond issue in two bond orders, 85 million for parks and rec and 115 million for streets and sidewalks. Parks and rec order includes 43 million for the former wheels fun park and 42 million for the renovation and enhancement of East End and Longmeadow parks. The streets and sidewalk order includes 60 million for new sidewalks. That's six zero, 60 million. 30 million for supplemental street paving, 15 million for supplemental sidewalk repairs, um, mentioned above, and then 10 million for unpaved roads. Approval of the bond issue now passes from city staff to elected leaders and citizens. I and other members of the council are planning a bond campaign and will need the active participation from members of boards and commissions like BPAC that have a direct interest in the bond referendum. If possible, I would like to add an item for next month's BPAC meeting to have a presentation and discussion of the November bond referendum. So I do think this is important. We should find a way to prioritize space in the meeting next month to do that um, with the stipulation that we also don't wanna cancel what we have planned um, in terms of guest speakers. My suggestion would be that I'll ask Carl that this be a condensed presentation, at least for June, um, and that we probably devote his part of the meeting to it. And that I might also ask that for next month, the committee reports get submitted in writing so that we don't have to spend as much time on them. 
but I want to put that, and this, again, this is very late breaking. This came to me like 45 minutes before this meeting. So this is maybe a half form thought, but I want to put it to everybody. Uh, how do, how do we feel about restructuring the next meeting so that we can accommodate this? Um, I do think it's very important. And, and keep in mind that the July is not the next opportunity. We're skipping July. So um... that's a big part of the urgency, but thank you for pointing that out. Yes. Yeah. I like your, the way you propose the restructuring. Give Carl a little more time. Committee reports. I'm uh, I'm importantly getting a thumbs up from Marissa because she's actually in charge of planning the next meeting. So that's that was the one I was really concerned about. But does anybody else um, have uh, Marie? Mary, thank you. All right, I'm 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 seeing broad consensus, and our uh, committee chairs are good to make your reports in writing next month. You can email those to me and Marissa and Hannah, and we'll just kind of read them into the record in the minutes um, that way. Um, so we'll 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 structure the agenda around that accordingly, and I'll I'll communicate with Carl to make sure we know what the time expectations are on that. But I I think this is really important. So thank you for being accommodating. Uh, any questions on that? I can't play the role of Carl much more than just reading his email, but. Okay, great. Then we will move on to the committee reports for this month. Um, and Ideal's not here, so we don't have one for Triple E. I was at that meeting. We talked about volunteer opportunities. Uh, I will remind you about the Biking Wall Black event, uh, which is tomorrow night. Um, at the Poof Center in Wellens Village. Show of hands, who's going to that? See me, Chris, I know I have Nathan, Royal, great. We got good BPAC representation there tomorrow night. I was curious, did, we, did you get any update from Ideal about what we need to do if we're volunteering? I was I was planning on, and we had discussed uh, doing bike valet stuff, so. I just yeah, to... she asked if we could be there at 5.30 and we'll sort of figure it out then. Okay. So. Please be there at 5.30 if you're planning to volunteer. Does anybody need the link to register for it? Everybody got that? I have it somewhere if anybody. Royal, do you need it? Okay, I will. Give me two seconds and I'll drop in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, I need it. Okay. Because I do know that it is somewhat limited capacity. I don't think they're full. Link's in the chat. Do you need Go the ahead. register if you're volunteering too? or? You know... That wasn't That's obvious to me. I registered anyway just to be safe. I but if you if you volunteer, no one's going to turn you away. I I I'll, I will say that. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I do know one of the main tasks for volunteers is actually going to be to be outside with the bikes. So, um, I guess it doesn't really affect capacity. So, <laughs> um, okay, great. So um, if you volunteer though, you can't see the program uh it might be tricky yeah yeah i know you won't be seeing the program so um if you want to see the program you might want to yeah figure out the time that you would want to see it i i think either way it's great to have good representation to be back there because we are a sponsor of the event so please please come in whatever capacity you feel led to do I think we're going to I think we're going to be pretty good on volunteers. That's the impression I get. Um, the other thing that we got talked about at Triple E was um, ongoing efforts in the scorecard report. Um, it was kind of in the weeds. I don't really think I want to get into that right now, but it is moving ahead. So thank you for everybody who's participating on that. And we'll we'll come back to that next meeting, I think. Um, Devrev, Scott. Yes, thank you. So we had three uh, development plans this month, uh, two small ones and a bigger one. The first one um, was 5502 Wake Forest Highway. So it's on North Carolina 98 and Kemp, the intersection. It's near Falls Village Golf Course and Neal Middle School, 2.3 acres. And it's um, non-residential they want to there's a fair bit of residential around it and they want to change it to commercial general so this one um, marissa asked for a 12 foot multi-use path with a yellow stripe 
and a 10 foot tree line buffer between the multi-use path and the road along Kemp and along 98. So it's on the corner there. So that's our standard request um, for multi-use path. Uh, next one, I looked at Chin Page Road Apartments. This was a big one and it's in RTP um, off Miami. Uh, Chin Page Road is uh, intersects Miami Boulevard and they want to go from rural residential on this one. It's like an open farm area to uh, a townhouse apartment complex on 24 acres and they wanna put 360 units there. So it's currently right across the street um, from this Pinnacle Park, which has Wolf Speed as the big main business in there um, and Silicon Drive. So it's on, you know, literally across the street. And Chin Page Road is designated for a bike lane. So we asked for that. And across the street, uh, right on the corner is a designation for Page Branch Trail, which is a two mile greenway that's in the CTP. So we asked for a connection to that. And uh, so we have a 12 foot multi-use path, a bike lane on Chin Page Road. Um, we also, it's a good uh, application for a roundabout. So we asked them to consider a roundabout there on Chin Page Road and the intersection with Sil Silicon Drive and connection to the trail. All right, the next one, uh, Brian looked at Methodist Street Townhomes. It's also on Miami Boulevard, but it's between Ellis and Lumley. And it was only 1.2 acres, but they want to put uh, 18 townhomes on it. Uh, the only real request here, since you can't get a bike lane really added to Miami Boulevard, is there are two bus stops uh, on Miami that are within a short distance of Methodist Street, which is this cross street. And so the request was to improve the bus stops to add shelters to them and also Put a pedestrian crossing in at Methodist because you have to go like half a mile walk uh, down to Ellis, cross the street, half a mile walk back if you want to go south at the you know the bus stop there, and otherwise you can cross uh, Miami, which is super busy. So um, really, the main uh, thrust there is to try to get uh, bus stop transit improvements. So those are the three that we looked at. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And uh, Pi, Nathan. All right, um, we talked about a few things. The UDO people emailed us and asked us for more comments if we have them. And so we have um, some drafts in the B the Pi folder for that, that we'll hopefully send to them after our next Pi meeting. We also were made aware of some sidewalk projects that are in the design phase with public works that they haven't done any engagement about. So we have reached out and gotten those plans to review for next high meeting as well. Um, and that is basically it. There's also um, Nate Baker is trying to push an adoption of NACTO standards, but NACTO doesn't have standards. It only has guidelines. So that effort wouldn't replace the effort to make a real street design guide or street design manual like a lot of other more urbanist forward cities have. So we would still need to probably undertake an actual street design manual effort and not just rely on NACTO guidelines if Nate can get that turned into something at all. That's it. Great, thank you. Um, oh yeah, I didn't realize I had you back to back. You got anything to add on Duke? You're next on that. No, all the kids have left, so all of the momentum is gone. So okay. I'll have nothing to report until August or September. Du duly noted, submitting because... a report and writing next month shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Royal, uh, NC Central. Or Fayetteville Street Corridor. Oh, did we? Oh, I think he's not here. That's weird. Okay, well, if he comes back on, we'll let him update. Um, Dost, Jeff. Um, I am actually no longer on Dost. Um, oh. I had too many commitments with being on BPAC and Dost and I had to choose one and I chose BPAC. So I'm actually going to be looking to uh, 
to join one of the committees, either PI or Triple E. Okay. Well, thank you for choosing us. Um, cool. Uh, it's, and, it's the it's the cooler group. I mean, obviously. So, uh, <laughs> cool. Uh, Mary Rose, anything on Vision Zero this month? Yeah. So, um, I got a few things. There's going to be a Vision Zero update uh, presented to City Council during the May 23rd work session, um, and it's going to include a request to approve the new Vision Zero resolution. Uh, the biggest update in the resolution is that they're adding a target date uh, to reduce and eliminate traffic deaths and serious injuries by 50% by 2035 and end traffic deaths and serious injuries by 2045. Um, and these target dates are part of um, the eligibility criteria for grants implementation. Um, and then the city is also hoping to put together an application for supplemental planning and demonstration funds by August 29th, which will include speed management, street safety audits, and the street design guideline um, or guidelines um, to be prioritized in that application. Um, and then Lauren's planning to have some community meetings that are not yet scheduled. Uh, one of which is for late June and the other for late August, early September, all around the, the Vision Zero plan. Great. So that's picking up. Do, do you know if she wants or needs any support from us in, on any of those initiatives or events yet? Uh, I don't know, but I'll reach out to her and see okay. what is she'll need help on. Okay, great. Glad to hear that's moving ahead. Okay, we did a good job getting through business tonight, y'all. Um, are there any announcements and updates or updates beyond what we've already talked through? Uh, this is Ed, I have an announcement. Um, so, um, so there's an event that is being planned for Tuesday, June 25th in Durham. Um, it's just was recently announced. There's this thing happening. It's currently, it's it's happening now. It's called the Caravan for Disability Justice um, that is rolling across the country. And it had been set to make stops in Raleigh, Hillsboro, and Charlotte as it passed through North Carolina next month. And uh, recently was announced that they were going to make a stop in Durham on Tuesday, the 25th. Um, some there's not a whole lot by way of details other than that it will be Tuesday the 25th of June, um, probably starting at five, going till seven or eight o'clock. That's uncertain. Um, the format of it is uncertain. There'll be speakers. Uh, it will be um, it, it'll involve a, a, a collaboration of different disability advocacy and rights groups in Durham. Um, uh, mobility disabilities, sensory disabilities, um, intellectual developmental disability groups, autism groups are working together on prepare, preparing the event. And the reason I bring it up is because um, one of the planners shared with me that one of the things on, on the radar of a number of these groups uh, is the problem with inaccessible sidewalks and missing sidewalks and broken sidewalks in, in Durham, which have a serious impact on people with disabilities. So there may be an element to this event that um, focuses on um, the impact of the, the sidewalk deficits in Durham on people with disabilities. Um, so that's why I bring it up here. Um, I. We'll certainly know more about it by the time of our June 18th meeting. Um, I don't know that there'll be a role for BPAC to play, pro probably not, but it just may be something of interest to our, our group. And as more information about that event um, rolls out, I will share it with y'all. Oh. Oh, that, that's great. And I think, I mean, I think if nothing else, we could boost it through our social media presence, mm -hmm. such as it is. So we'll make sure to let Andres know um, details when we have them, especially if they are um, emphasizing the sidewalk angle. But e even if they aren't, I think we can still promote it. So, great, thank you. 
Cool. Thank you. Are uh, any other announcements or updates? I have one. Um, so Ray Delahenty, who um, goes by City Nerd on uh, social media, he is a uh, urbanist transportation YouTuber who is coming to Durham um, just to check it out. And he's doing a um, just like a regular meetup talk to people at full steam on June 10th, which is a Monday evening at 7.30. So if anybody wants to go to full steam and meet an urbanist YouTuber, that'll be happening. What time handle, handle again? City nerd, you said? City nerd, yes. Uh, from 7.30 to 10 p.m. Cool, thanks for sharing. Anything else? Cool. Okay. So as far as communications priorities coming out of here, sounds like Pi is going to be offering up some more comments on the UDO, right? I hear that. Okay, cool. Um, I need to very quickly convene with uh, Hannah, uh, Marissa, and Carl just about the structure of next month's meeting. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page planning that. I will, I'll send you all an email about that in the next 24 hours, maybe the next hour. Um, since I'm going to be disappearing soon, that's my, uh, not an announcement, but a reminder, I will be basically away for most of the next month. So if you have questions or concerns for BPAC, um, feel free to copy me, but make sure they go to Marissa. She's She's got the keys to the house this month. Um, really up, up to and including the next meeting. So um, let's see. And we'll look for more info from Ed on the uh, the uh, disability justice event happening on June 25th. And I think that's it for this month. Did I miss anything, Nathan? I have a question just about our break in July. Does that include no subcommittee meetings as well? I actually don't know. Okay. I think it's up to the subcommittees, unless yeah. anybody knows otherwise. I think, it's up, I think it's up to the subcommittees, but last year we didn't have subcommittee meetings. Okay. I would encourage subcommittee chairs to uh, poll or make an executive decision this month about July meetings. Either way, up to you. Okay, that's it. Then I think we're gonna have a rare early finish to our meeting. And congratulations to us. We don't need to move to end early, do we? We always move to, to, to stretch it out, but we don't need a motion to end early. Right? I do not feel like we need permission to end early. Well, technically, don't we need a motion to adjourn? Go for it. Motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Have a good evening. We'll see you good next night. Time. Thanks, everyone.